So here uh, we have a system, a linear time invariant system, where the output y of t is equal to x of t minus 3. Okay? So let's look at the case, um, uh, two possible uh, inputs here. One is for x of t equal to e to the j to t. Okay? So this is a uh, single complex exponential. <clears throat> okay. So in this case, the output y of t is e to the j to t minus 3. Right? Because y of t is x of t minus 3, so if you substitute t minus 3 inside here, you get e to the j2 times t minus 3. Okay? So you can split this into two terms. One is e to the minus j6 times e to the j2t. So you can see that inserting inserting a complex exponential will give you an output that is equal to the same complex exponential times this e to the minus j6. Okay. So in this example, the eigenfunction is this e to the j to t and the corresponding eigenvalue is e to the minus j6. <coughs> now, alternatively, we can also uh, we can also derive the eigenvalue in a uh, different way. So, uh, alternatively, right, we know that for this system here, we know that the impulse response is h of t equal to delta of t minus 3. Right. The impulse response is <coughs> the system's response to an impulse at the input. Okay. So if you replace x with delta, then you get the impulse response uh, h of t. Now, since the impulse response is delta of t minus 3, then using, using the formula here, we can compute this h of s, okay, the eigenvalue for a general input s, and this h of s, which is the integral of h of tau e to the minus s tau d tau is equal to the integral of delta tau minus 3 e to the uh, minus s tau d tau. Okay. So by the sampling property, right, when you integrate a function times a unit impulse at time 3, the output is just this function evaluated at time 3. Okay? So this would give you e to the minus s 3. Okay? So therefore, if you're looking for the eigenvalue corresponding to an eigenfunction with exponent 2j, then the eigenvalue is just h of this j2, right, which is e to the minus j6. Okay. So in this example, the input is just a single complex exponential. Okay. Now, in this second example here, we have x of t equal to cosine 4t plus cosine 7t. Okay. Now, by Euler's relation, we can split the cosines into the sum 
of two uh, uh, complex exponentials. So in particular, I can write x of t as one half e to the j four t plus one half e to the minus j four t. Okay. So by Euler's relation, this plus this divided by two gives you cosine. Okay. So similarly for the second term, I get one half e to the uh, j 7t plus 1 half e to the minus j 7t. OK? So by writing it in this form, uh, you can see that x of t is indeed a linear combination of complex exponentials. So then what would be the output, right? If the input is a linear combination of complex exponentials, the output should also be a linear combination of these complex exponentials, but each one scaled with a, cor with a different uh, H of S, okay? So in this case, Y of T should be equal to 1 half h of j4 e to the j4t, right? Because e to the j4t has a response that is equal to the eigenvalue times e to the j4t, and then times the same coefficient, 1 half. And similarly, for the other terms, So similarly, for the, for the other terms, I have the same complex exponential times the corresponding eigenvalue, right, and same for set, uh, j7t and minus j7t as well, okay? Now h, right, we're looking at the same system, right? So h, it, we already derived up here. So we just have to plug in these values inside s uh, to get what we want. So if we do that, uh, this is e to the minus 12j this is e to the 12j <coughs> this is e to the minus 21j And this is e to the 21j, e to the j 7t. Okay. Now, again, by Euler's relation, we can combine these two terms. Uh, you can see that the exponents are just complex conjugates of each other. So uh, we can combine these two into a cosine. So this gives us cosine 4t minus 3, right? So 4t is here. 4 times minus 3 is minus 12 here, OK? So these two combines into cosine 4t minus 3. And these two combines into cosine 7t minus 3. OK?
Okay, so uh, what we have talked about here is that, you know, if you have an input signal, x of t, that can be written as a superposition of these complex exponentials, then the output can also be written as the superposition of the same complex exponentials, each one scaled by their eigenvalue. Okay? But then the question is, what signals can be represented as a linear combination or superposition of these complex exponentials? Okay. If this does not all happen very often, then obviously this would not be of interest to us, right? So what's interesting, right, we're going to state this without proof here, okay? But what's interesting is that, you know, first of all, we know that any continuous time periodic signals can be represented as a linear combination of complex exponentials, okay? And not any complex exponentials, but actually the set of harmonically related uh, complex exponentials. Okay? Right. So suddenly this makes uh, this makes this property much more interesting, right? Because this fact here, right? The, the this uh, the fact that, you know, um, I can represent a signal as a linear combination of complex exponentials actually does not occur, you know, in rare cases, but actually occurs for all periodic signals, okay? And not only... Right. Uh, not only are they linear combinations, these periodic signals, not only are they linear combinations of complex exponentials, but actually they are linear combinations of harmonically related complex exponentials. Okay. Right. Now let's see uh, what this, uh, what's the consequence of this, okay? Now recall what is a periodic signal, okay? So we say that a signal is periodic if for some positive capital T, uh, x of t is equal to x of t plus capital T for all t, okay? So we say that a signal x of t is periodic with period capital T if this holds for all, for all t, okay? And again, uh, the fundamental period is the smallest period that you can find such that this holds, and the fundamental frequency is just 2 pi over uh, this uh, fundamental period, uh, capital T. Okay? So the fundamental period and the fundamental frequency. Okay. So two obvious examples of periodic signals are such as this periodic complex exponential itself, or if you just take the real part, uh, you get this uh, sinusoid uh, cosine omega naught t, okay? So both of these signals uh, have fundamental frequency omega naught, and fundamental period t equal to 2 pi over omega naught. <coughs> okay. Now what this statement above is saying is that, you know, any periodic signal can be written as a linear combination of complex exponentials, okay? Complex exponentials uh, of uh, complex exponentials of this type 
here. Okay. Now, if you have a signal that is periodic with period capital T, which complex exponentials do you think would be contained in this signal x of t? So right now we're saying that x of t can be written as a linear combination of these complex exponentials with pure imaginary exponent. So these are basically pure sinusoids, okay? So if you imagine that x of t can be written as a linear combination of pure sinusoids, what would be these pure sinusoids, right? What should be the frequency of these uh, pure sinusoids? So it's not hard to imagine that if the signal x of t has period capital T, then all the pure sinusoids that you know, form x of t should also have period capital T, right? OK. And all sinusoids, right, all of these complex exponentials, that have period, the same period, capital T, okay, are called harmonically related complex exponentials. Okay? So, the complex exponentials that form this periodic signal with period capital T are the set of harmonically related complex exponentials with the same period capital T, or in other words, complex exponentials that have frequency that is integer multiples of the fundamental frequency omega naught. Okay? So by choosing complex exponentials that have frequency that are integer multiples of omega naught, we obtain this set of complex exponentials that all have period T. Okay? Okay. All right, so this is not hard, hard to imagine, right? If you want to take these complex exponentials to form a signal that is peri periodic with period T, then obviously you would want to choose these complex exponentials such that they themselves are periodic with period T. Okay? All right. So uh, this, uh, in continuous time, right, this, the set of harmonically related complex exponentials can potentially be infinite, right? Because we can take any integer multiple of K for k equal to 0, plus minus 1, plus minus 2, and so on and so forth, OK? So a general linear combination of harmonically related complex exponentials is then a signal x of t that can be written as the summation of some coefficient a k times e to the j k omega naught t, OK? So we're taking linear combinations of these harmonically related complex exponentials each with the coefficient a k. Okay? Now, since each one of these complex exponentials are periodic with period t, when you sum them together, this x of t must also be periodic with period t. Okay? So since this is periodic with period t, summing them up, will also give you something that is periodic with period t, okay? And the representation of a periodic signal x of t in the form given here is called the Fourier series representation of the periodic signal.
All right. So this next example here uh, tries to give you a you know idea of what combining these harmonically related complex exponentials uh, would give you. Okay. So in this example, we have x of t uh, that has fundamental frequency two pi, and can be written as a linear combination of these complex exponentials e to the j k two pi t for k from minus three up to three. Okay. Now, a uh, a complex exponential that it with frequency k multiple of omega naught is called uh, right among this set of harmonically related complex exponentials is said to be a harmonic component of the kth order. Okay, so if k is equal to two, then it's the second order harmonic component. If it's equal to n, it's the nth uh, harmonic component. Okay, and when k is plus or equal to uh, plus or minus one then we say it's the first harmonic component or the fundamental harmonic component, okay? So in this example here, we're saying that x of t is composed by uh, the first the second and the third harmonic component. Okay? So this corresponds to k that is plus or plus minus one, plus minus two, and plus minus three. Now when k is equal to zero, then this is just a constant. Okay? So also the constant term. Now the coefficients are uh, given here, okay? So let's plug in the, these coefficients into x of t. So this gives you x of t equal to one plus one over four times e to the j two pi t plus e to the minus j two pi t plus one half e to the j 4 pi t plus e to the minus j 4 pi t plus 1 over 3 e to the 6 uh, e to the j 6 pi t plus e to the minus j 6 pi t. Okay? So one over four corresponds to cases where k is equal to one or minus one. Okay, so when k is equal to one or minus one, we have uh, exponentials e to the j two pi t and e to the minus j two pi t. Okay, so one half corresponds to k equal to two and minus two, so we have four and minus four here. And one over three corresponds to k equal to three and minus three, so we have six pi and minus six pi here. Okay? <coughs> now by Euler's relation, all these terms can be combined to form a cosine uh, sinusoid. Okay? So this is equal to one plus one half cosine 2 pi t plus cosine 4 pi t plus 2 over 3 cosine 6 pi t. Okay? Now, let us uh, denote this as x1 x2, x3, okay. x4. Okay. 
Now, when we think of periodic signals, right, periodic signals are things that repeat every period, capital T, okay? But a periodic signal, even though it repeats, it can actually take on any, any possible shape, right? So for example, you may have a periodic signal that looks something like this, right? So on and so forth. Or you could have a periodic signal that looks something like this. Okay. Okay. Or any any uh, shape that you can imagine. Okay. But if you think of a sinusoid, sinusoid is of a very specific shape. Right? Sinusoid is a very specific shape. Right. So if you think of a sinusoid, let's say with a period T, then you're thinking of something that looks like this. Right? Or right, if you have a slightly higher frequency, you may have something like this. Okay, so on and so forth. Okay. So it's it may be a little bit difficult to imagine how can we construct a periodic signal of arbitrary shape using you know these sinusoids of this regular pattern okay so this example sort of gives you an idea uh, of the possibility of this happening right because if you look at these four terms right so these four terms are pure sinusoids, okay, or pure sinusoids. The first term is a constant. But as you start to add more and more of these sinusoidal terms together, right, suppose you add the first two, you get this. If you add x2 further inside, you get this. As you add x3 inside, you get this, okay? So you can sort of see that as you add more and more sinusoidal terms inside, you can actually get patterns that you know, potentially can look really different than the original sinusoidal pattern, okay? So this sort of gives you an idea that, you know, even though a periodic signal can take on really odd shapes, but we can actually still reconstruct any periodic signals as long as we, you know, put together these uh, sinusoids of more and more terms, okay?